Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, this is a first for me to have followed a Buddhist person uh, that studied. So I really enjoyed uh, hearing those comments. Um, this is a great opportunity for me to be here today because I think it really, I think the fact, having gotten to know Timberlane over the last few years has just been a wonderful experience. The educators, the parents, the people that are work here uh, has just really been very amazing. And I'm very proud to be the commissioner of the state of New Hampshire because in spite of so many things that are going on, our educators have still, are still there for the students in our state. I want to start first with just a quote that I think sort of um, reflects a little bit more about what I'll be talking about today. Your greatness is measured by your kindness, your education and intellect by your modesty, your ignorance is portrayed by your suspicions and prejudices, and your real caliber is measured by the consideration and tolerance you have for others. And this was uh, a quote made by William Bachter. Uh, um, he was a religious leader and very influential public speaker. So for me, uh, over the last, well, I'm beginning my fourth year, it's been a really long uh, period of time in my own growth and development as a person. Uh, when I think of kindness, you know, I think of uh, giving of, of myself, I think of charity, I think of the kinds of things that most of us think about in this room. But one of the things that I've learned is that there are really sort of three different types of uh, kindness. The first one is really that gestural kindness, when you do something on demand. Um, you give a smile, you hold a door, uh, you um, do something that makes the other person feel better. And then you move on. You forget about it. You just move on. The second type of kindness uh, is really um, more like random acts of kindness. Um, you know, some people will say you're standing on a... Um, a line at the supermarket and you only have two items and the other person has uh, uh, you know, 25 and you say, oh, you could stand in front of me and you do something random, something really nice. You hold a door, uh, you smile at a baby, you talk to an, an aging person. So those random acts of kindness. But the third one is the one that I think that's really, really important to us as educators and that's that in internal spirit of kindness regardless of what's going on around you. It's that consistency that people look toward us as educators, parents, um, that, that kind of support that is always available. When um, I'm going to tell you a few little tiny stories that really uh, touched my life as I've been working um, as commissioner. One was I, I get an opportunity to visit many schools, and it's the best part of my job to go into a school and see what's going on and talk with teachers and parents and volunteers and leaders. And one day I was in a school, and it was, I got to be reading a, um, a book to a group of kindergarten children. And we're sitting in a circle just like this, and I sit down right on the floor. I was a kindergarten teacher. I got right in there, and I, I really loved it. And we read the story, and we were, you know how at the end of it we're all talking. And this little boy kept looking over at me and looking at me and looking at me, and I smiled and, you know, tried to engage him. And, and all of a sudden he said, can I ask a question? And, he, and I said, of course, tell me your question. He said, do you have a mortgage on your house? <laughs> and he's five years old. And immediately, while the question surprised me, what I jumped right to is that this is a child that's living in an environment where money is a struggle. And he was already, at five years old, familiar with the term mortgage. And so, at the end of our little circle time, I had a chance to sit down and talk with him, and um, he sort of opened up. And when I was leaving, the teacher said to me, you know, that's the first time this child has ever really started talking about his life. And then the teacher said, I think I feel different about him. I think I need to learn more. That was one uh, particular uh, period of time that really made me think about um, all the lives of the children that we work with, and what's behind their lives? Um, and, and do we understand that? In the elementary schools, we see so many children. Um, we, Malcolm and I are just talking about bullying and uh, you know, people's understanding of bullying. At the end of the day, I can't even tell you, hundreds and hundreds of parents call throughout the day looking for support because their child is being bullied. And they're looking for someone to listen to them, to support them to care about them, to share in their worry. And this goes on all over, our, all over our country. And the children in our elementary schools just really need that extra kindness. 
And when I go into a school where positive behavioral support is going on, or programs, or the teachers are all working together, and the leaders, and they are caring about the daily ways of making children feel important and competent, I see a very, very different school. In my work, I have an opportunity to visit uh, prisons throughout the state. And uh, I can tell you, when I first started this process, I was very, very anxious about it. Um, because during my, uh, my own studies, I worked in a federal prison uh, with people that would remain in prison for the remainder of their life, a federal prison. So it was very anxious for me to go back into that type of setting. But I get to go to the graduations of people that complete their GEDs or their high school diplomas while they're in, in prison. So when I first started doing it, I started meeting the parents or uh, spouses or people that would come to support, but it was always a small group of people that came for these people uh, that were imprisoned, and it was very sad. So I kept thinking, what can I do? What can I do to make a difference? I don't want to come as the commissioner. I want to come as a real person that really understands that there's a reason why they're here, and very often for young people, it's because they didn't have the support, because they came from great dysfunction in their lives. So I decided that I would do this strategy. And so I brought my business cards, and after I had a chance to award their diploma, at the end of it, I asked to meet with each one of uh, the young men, it was particularly young men, and I gave them my card. And I talked a little bit about um, possibilities when uh, they left prison. And I talked about, here's my card, when you leave prison, get in touch with me. We will help you. And lo and behold, about a year later, I'm at a State Board of Education meeting, and my secretary comes running in and she says, you need to leave right now, somebody's here to see you. And I went out and it was this young man, and he said, I'm out of prison, I need help. I don't have a place to live, I'm on parole, I have $45, I want to go back to school. And then he proceeded to tell me his story. He had been in high school, he had four credits to graduate, I got into very deep trouble as a result of drugs. Um, his high school was not there for him. He was a problem. He was a throwaway kid. He was the kind of kid that they were glad to get rid of. But he was a bright, intelligent young man that came from such dysfunction. The fact that he even survived prison was a miracle. Immediately, everyone got together. We found a place for him to live. We, we were able to um, get him into Manchester Community College. We had a philanthropist that had been calling me over a period of several months asking when we found a person that was there and needed help to call. We called the philanthropist. We were able to get this young man into uh, Manchester Community College. And lo and behold, three months later, I got a call from a counselor there and said, do you know, who, do you know much about this young man? And I said, well, I, I don't know what he shared with you. I know very little. And she said, well, I need to tell you that he's functioning out of 162 IQ. This is a young man that could have gone far with the right support. So kindness is really about that ability to sort of search your soul and look at each person as a person. At the end of a long day, as I mentioned before, it's not unusual for someone to come and say, would you be willing to talk to me, an aging person? I'm worried about my grandchildren. They're not writing yet. They're not reading. And I'm really worried because they may never make it. Could you help me? They bring albums of their children. And we sit. And sometimes it's until 6 o'clock on a Friday night. But th what they're looking for is someone to just listen, someone to care enough about who they are as a person. Often in my work, I've had to work with policymakers. And it's been very complex, as you know, in our state. But one thing I've learned by reaching out is the fact that somebody believes something entirely different than I do, and someone acts entirely different than I ever would. I've learned by reaching out that their beliefs and values are as equally important to them as my beliefs and values are, and that together we can make a difference. So when I think about kindness and I think about educators, I think first and foremost, that we have to be able to search into our own soul and be willing, be really willing to listen. And for me, as I look around our society and I work with people, I think that's the one thing that's missing so often. It's that quickness to dismiss, to not listen, to think you know, 
to think you understand what this person is all about. So I really believe that the art of really learning to integrate kindness is learning to listen to people and be responsive. You know, the same old communication skills that we've lived with over the years, and that is look people in the face. Give them the gesture that they are important enough to you, that you care enough. And I really believe that that type of kindness is what's going to get us through very difficult times in this country. You need to reach out. And that's one thing I've learned in the last three years. I kind of considered my pers myself a person that reached out all the time, but I have learned to reach out so much better because people have learned to reach out to me. And they have made me feel more important as a human being in this humankind society. We need a connection. We all need a connection in our society. Kindness to me is about that connection. It's about that gesture. It's about that reaching out. And I believe every educator that's effective, every parent, every community member that reaches out is going to make a difference. And it will bring us closer to that sense of peace that all of us are really searching for. And that peace when you get up in a morning like this and you're going to spend the day with a, that hundred people that care enough to be here and to learn about the feelings of other individuals. So I'd like to close um, with um, another quote. Those who make kindness an essential part of their lives find the joy of life. Kindness deepens the spirit and produces rewards that cannot be completely explained in words. It is an experience more powerful than words. To become acquainted with kindness, one must be prepared to learn new things and feel new feelings. Kindness is more than a philosophy of the mind. It is a philosophy of the spirit. And when our speaker was speaking and I closed my eyes and I thought of people that I love very much, my very first day starting as commissioner, my mother passed away unexpectedly. And I, it was amazing. Um, it was my first day. I didn't know what to do. I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. So I went up to the North Country, and I went to uh, the North Country graduation where it's at-risk students. Students, again, throwaway students. And I walked into this room, and there were 300 parents, family members, there to celebrate their kids who may not have been successful. And I had to say some words. And it was an amazing spiritual moment for me. Because for that moment in time, I was able to remember my mother and her support and her passion and her ability to listen and just step back and say, you are all great parents. You've done an amazing job. Thank you.